Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. On a hot Sunday in September of 2016, Tex and Diane McIver played golf in the searing Georgia sun for four hours. They picked up Diane's best friend, Danny Joe Carter, from their Putnam County ranch where she had been riding horses before they all headed back to Atlanta, stopping for dinner in Conyers. The McIvers had been drinking, so after dinner, Danny drove the rest of the way home, with Diane in the front seat and Tex behind her in the back seat. At around 10 p.m. that Sunday night, Atlanta traffic was at a standstill on the downtown connector. Diane told Danny Joe to get off at Edgewood Avenue. Tex had fallen asleep in the back seat, and his wife fussed at him to wake up so he'd be able to sleep that night. When he looked around and saw the area they were in, he said, Girls, this was a bad idea. This is a bad area. And then he said, Darling, hand me my gun. Diane McIver then handed her husband the gun that would kill her. The Atlanta PD charged McIver with involuntary manslaughter, but the DA disagreed and charged Tex McIver with malice murder. But did Tex McIver really mean to kill his wife? Welcome to Episode 66, Tex and Diane McIver, Accident or Murder. Atlanta, Georgia is one of the most famous U.S. Southern cities in the world. During the American Civil War, the burning of Atlanta was crucial in General Sherman's march to the sea. It crippled the Confederacy and was the beginning of the end of the Civil War. The city fell in September of 1864, and the war ended in April 1865. The fall of Atlanta was extensively covered by Northern newspapers, and it gave a huge boost to Northern morale, as well as President Lincoln's political standing, as he won the election that November by a significant margin. Sadly, Lincoln was assassinated just five days after Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered in Appomattox, Virginia. Today, modern Atlanta is known for its eclectic, diverse culture. It has been a mecca for African-American political power, education, and culture. There has been a black mayor in office in Atlanta since 1974. During the Civil Rights Movement in the 60s, a popular Atlanta slogan was it was a city too busy to hate a slogan that would continue into the 90s. And in comparison to other large cities in the Deep South, the progressive politics and diversity would make that slogan ring true. But in reality, the people of Atlanta are still dealing with racial disparity, tensions, and the economic effects of gentrification. In 2016, when Diane McIver was killed, Atlanta was in an exciting transitional phase. Real estate prices that had lagged since the recession finally saw an uptick. New ground was broken for retail and office spaces. The Braves left Turner Field for SunTrust Park, a new entertainment complex within walking distance of bars, shopping, and residential areas. In popular culture, the critically acclaimed show Atlanta premiered, as well as Stranger Things, the Netflix hit, that while set in Indiana, had been filmed in Atlanta and surrounding areas, giving another boost to the local economy. On April 14th, Prince played his final show at the Fox Theater in what Patch.com called an intimate, stripped-down performance just a week before his death. That May, Atlanta was chosen to host the 2019 Super Bowl, making way for a new $1.4 billion stadium that would host the Atlanta Falcons and the new Atlanta Soccer Club. 2016 was also the third year of the Black Lives Matter movement. In July, Hundreds had marched in downtown Atlanta to protest police shootings. The day before, a young black man had been found hanging in Piedmont Park. The AJC reported that the protest was in part a reaction to what many believed was a modern-day lynching. However, the young man's death was ruled a suicide, and his social media posts showed that he had been shamed by his family for being gay. It was a terrible coincidence, as there were so many police shootings nationwide that had led to the protests. In the first half of July alone, there were 112 protests in 88 cities. It's important to mention the Atlanta March because it does become a factor in this case, though there was no official march on the day Diane McIver was killed. But still, the specter of dangerous Black Lives Matter protesters was raised by Tex McIver's PR guy. 
a move that was seriously detrimental to MacIver's defense. I'm going to pause now for a short commercial break. Claude Lee McIver was born in San Antonio, Texas on December 22, 1943. He graduated from law school at the University of Texas before moving to Atlanta. Claude, known as Tex all of his life, worked for Fisher Phillips Law Firm for decades. He was a labor lawyer, but he didn't represent the little guy. He represented the corporations. By 2016, he was a longtime partner, but recently he went from equity partner to income partner meaning his income dropped from about $700,000 a year to about $120,000 a year. He was 73 years old. That's not unusual. Tex McIver was also a staunch Republican who served on the state election board for 12 years. He was nominated by the governor in 2005 to be on the Judicial Nomination Committee. And even more telling, he served on the American Bar Association Committee on Gun Violence. Tex was a man who knew guns. He didn't just know them, he loved them, owning close to 40 guns, some 22 of those being rifles. He was such a good shot, he could toss a bottle in the air and hit it. Tex McIver married his first wife, Nancy, in 1966. They had three kids, two sons and a daughter. Nancy filed for divorce in 1997, citing several affairs she said Tex had. Specifically, that he was having an affair with a woman that worked at their Putnam County ranch. The 85-acre ranch was Texas crown jewel. He had horses and cattle and a big, sprawling ranch house, as well as a guest house and pool. Tex kept the ranch in the divorce, but otherwise took quite the hit financially. It was an ugly three-year court battle. When they settled in July of 2000, Tex had spent more than 100000 on attorney's fees, and he had agreed to pay Nancy almost $700,000 in alimony. Nancy also got half of his retirement account, which was valued at a little over 700000 at the time of settlement, and also half of their property, which was $400,000. Tex also had to pay 100000 for her attorney's fees. The settlement even stipulated how Tex could visit their dog, Malone. Quote, The wife shall allow the husband to use her garden hose, if necessary, to wash the dog after one of his visits. His daughter and one of his sons stopped speaking to him after the ugly divorce, to the point that he wasn't even invited to his daughter Meredith's wedding. At the time of his divorce, his assets totaled almost $1 million, but his monthly income was down to $17,000 a month. He used to bring in close to 60000 But like I said, his age and semi-retirement had changed his salary. He met Diane the year of his divorce though there is no speculation whatsoever that there was any overlap or that she was one of the affairs Nancy accused him of. He met her through business associates and was immediately enamored of the beautiful 47-year-old woman. Being 10 years her senior didn't deter him at all. Diane Biddy Smith McIver was born on July 21, 1953, in Auburn, Alabama. She had a kind of rags-to-riches aura about her, but she grew up middle class though her relationship with her mother was always very volatile. She had never known her father, and her mother was an alcoholic, with several ex-husbands. Diane had a brother, who died in his early 20s. She moved to Atlanta with her family when she was in high school, and a business owner named Billy Corey hired her when she was just 17 years old as a part-time payroll clerk. She worked nights to earn an accounting degree from Georgia State University. In her first job for Corey at U.S. Enterprises, she started out answering phones and soon became president. U.S. Enterprises is the umbrella company that Corey Enterprises falls under. At the time of her death, Diane McIver was the CEO of Corey Enterprises, and her net worth was estimated at $12 million. She had worked for Corey Enterprises for 43 years. She was respected as a formidable businesswoman, ambitious, uncompromising, and tough as nails. Diane didn't marry until she was 40 years old. She always just said that was a mistake. She never had children of her own. Friends later said it was a painful divorce, and like Texas divorce, it was also ugly with the splitting of finances. 
and Diane was estranged from her mother for 15 years before her death. She wouldn't even attend her funeral, telling her neighbor that she would not shed one tear for her mother. Though Tex and Diane had met before, he started pursuing her more vigorously when she moved into the luxury villa Buckhead Condos in Atlanta in the summer of 2000. He slipped a note under her door, welcoming her to the building. She wasn't interested at first, but he wore her down. When she finally agreed to a date, it was dinner in Tex's apartment, and Diane showed up in yoga gear and a ball cap. She was determined that this was going nowhere. But Tex charmed her. Rachel Stiles, one of Diane's assistants, said, quote, He was the perfect match for Diane. Diane was a very strong woman. She intimidated a lot of men. They just didn't want to compete with her. But Tex didn't want to compete with her. He was just infatuated with her. Diane didn't trust many people, but seemed to trust those that worked for her. Her best friend, Denny Joe Carter, the one driving that night, was her manicurist. They had been friends for 40 years, though there was a 10-year period they didn't speak because Denny Joe had a drinking problem. She got sober and was then welcomed back into Diane's life. Diane's other trusted confidants were her two personal assistants at work and the man who detailed her car and ran errands for her. And that's about it. You would think a woman in her position would have many rich, high-society friends. But Diane chose to trust people who worked for her. It's not that she didn't rub elbows with the well-heeled in Atlanta. She did. But her close friends were more down-to-earth. And I think there is something else at play here. Diane could be a bit controlling. She was known as a very blunt person. She would tell you that you'd put on weight, but then offer tips on how to lose it. It wasn't really malicious. She was just fastidious. And she always thought she knew best. She could be really critical. But everyone in her life accepted that as the other side of the coin that was Diane. Because she was also very generous and loving. And she was hard on herself, too. It's probably why she felt critical of others. She got up at 5 a.m. every day to work out and she kept weights in her office. But you can't always behave that way with your peers and get away with it. Diane did, but her friends were not exactly her peers. She was the CEO of a company, a self-made millionaire. Her friends were mostly employees and co-workers. She didn't have close friends in her own social standing. Which isn't that unusual. How many female CEOs do you know? Her peer group would be mainly men in that sense. And before Tex, she had even decided not to remarry. I think that wealth can be insulating from the world's problems, but it can also be very isolating. You never know if someone is your real friend or if they want something from you. At least with employees, you know where you stand. But Diane wound up falling hard for Tex. They dated for almost five years before marrying in November of 2005 in a lavish ceremony at the ranch. Diane came down the aisle in a horse-drawn carriage. The horse, wearing a flower crown, was her maid of honor. And they lived a jet-setting, extravagant lifestyle. Trips to Paris and the south of France. She and Tex would fly into Louisville for the Kentucky Derby, but have Danny Joe or her husband drive their limo up so they could have it to ride around town in. But she was generous to Danny Joe with these trips, even if Danny Joe might drive the limo or handle some other things for her. She was getting to go on all these fabulous trips all over the world with her generous best friend. And Diane often lent money to her friends. Terry Brown was one of Diane's personal assistants at Corey Enterprises, and he was in charge of keeping track of the loans she gave friends. He told the AJC that around the third of every month, she would ask him if the money was all in. She loaned money, but with reasonable interest rates. And she even loaned money to Tex. It's important to note here that she and Tex made the decision before they married to keep their finances separate. Both had been through messy, expensive divorces, and both were still self-made millionaires. At the time of her death, it was estimated that Diane was worth around $12 million, but most of that was in real estate holdings. She had about 400000 in the bank. And Tex was worth about $1.7 million on his own. I told you before that his income had significantly decreased, but it's not like he was a poor man. The engagement ring he gave Diane was worth $60,000. The loan she made to Tex was to expand the guest house, making it a real party house on the property in the style of an Old West saloon. I've seen conflicting reports on whose idea this was. 
Friends told reporters that it was Diane's. She loved having huge parties on the ranch. Tex was fine with that, as long as she could pay for it. But she made it a loan in his name, with interest. He was paying around $1,500 a month on the loan, just the interest. It was supposed to have been a three-year loan, but in 2014, Diane extended the loan for another three years. Terry Brown said that Tex always made his payments on time. But the interesting thing on this extension is that she put a codicil that if Tex defaulted, she could call on the loan and take controlling interest of the ranch. Well, Tex had already willingly put her name on the deed to the ranch when they got married. This is where their finances seem murky to me. If she really was the one who wanted the saloon party house, she certainly could afford to pay for it. But she expected Tex to, and that codicil was her insurance that he would pay for it. But the same friends who claimed the saloon was her idea said that the loan through Tex was merely for tax purposes. She and Tex also made new wills in 2005. Much was made at Tex's trial about the possibility of another new will that Diane had recently made, but they never found proof of it. The other important person to point out when it comes to the McIver finances is their godson, Austin Schwal. His parents were divorced, and he was the son of a Fulton County judge. They both doted on the boy, but especially Diane, who never had children of her own. Austin called her Mommy Di. She threw him lavish birthday parties, paid for private school, and intended to pay for his college. If there were issues with her will, it was discussed on and off for a few years. It was Austin. Diane wanted to leave him everything, but Tex wanted to leave all, or at least part, to the son that still spoke to him. But Diane never legally changed her will. Despite the rumors the prosecution continuously brought up, there was no proof. No other will was ever found. The prosecution even put out an ad for any Atlanta lawyer who might have worked on a will for Diane McIver to please come forward. None did. But before we get into that, we need to go back to that Sunday night on September 6th, 2016. I'm going to pause now to hear a word from today's sponsors. That Sunday was a hot day for September, even in Georgia, with temperatures rising into the 90s. Diane, Tex, and Danny Joe had been at the ranch all weekend. Danny Joe later testified that Tex got up that morning and brought her and Diane coffee upstairs before making breakfast for everyone. He liked doing little things like that. He was always the courtly gentleman, even after 10 years of marriage. Tex and Diane had given Danny Joe a horse, and that Sunday, the McIvers went to meet a friend to play golf while Danny Joe stayed at the ranch to ride her horse. Tex later told investigators that his wife shot a 74 that day, while he shot a 92. They all had a lot of fun that day, despite the heat. After they finished playing golf, Tex and Diane picked up Danny Joe to head back to Atlanta. Danny Joe said they poured wine in a Yeti cup and sipped it as they headed to dinner in Conyers, Georgia, on the way back into the city. They were meeting a friend and colleague of Diane's for dinner at the Longhorn Steakhouse. There, a bottle of red wine was opened. Tex later said he didn't drink much of it because he didn't like it. But still, after dinner, Danny Joe took over the driving, because Diane and Tex had been drinking, and she was sober. As they neared Atlanta, traffic on the downtown connector was a parking lot. Even at 10 p.m. on a Sunday night, you can count on Atlanta traffic being the worst. Diane told Danny Joe to take the Edgewood Avenue exit, and then she turned around and fussed at Tex to wake up. He had fallen asleep in the back seat. Diane was in the front passenger seat, and Tex was directly behind her. She didn't want him to fall asleep because she said he wouldn't be able to sleep that night. When Tex woke up and looked around, he said, quote, Girls, this is a bad idea. This isn't safe. He was talking about the area of Midtown they were in. Diane said, we'll be on Piedmont shortly. But he said, quote, Darling, hand me my gun. And Diane reached into the center console and pulled out a snub-nosed thirty eight revolver wrapped in a plastic bag. And then she handed it to her husband. And here is where everything went wrong. Tex took the gun and laid it in his lap and then nodded back off to sleep. Danny Joe said that she was driving on Piedmont when she got stopped by a red light at either 12th or 13th Street, 
and then she heard a boom. She thought at first that they had been hit by another car, but Tex quickly said, I discharged the gun, and asked if everyone was all right. Diane said, Tex, what did you do? Danny Joe said she thought there would be a bullet hole in the floor of the car, and no one realized Diane was shot at first, not even Diane, until she started breathing heavy and slumped in her seat, and then she said, I've been shot. At this, Tex leaned forward, cradling her head, as Danny Joe stepped on the gas to speed to a hospital. This is another huge point of contention at trial. Why didn't they just call 911? Danny Joe admitted she was scared because of the location and wasn't sure how long it would take to get an ambulance there. She had Piedmont Hospital in mind, but didn't know the way. Tex spoke up and directed her to Emory Hospital, which was not the closest. Even if it was the closest, anyone from Atlanta can tell you that Grady Memorial Hospital has a renowned Level 1 trauma unit. It handles almost all gunshot wounds in Atlanta. At trial, the prosecution would apply that Tex intended to go to a further away hospital. But the truth is, Emory Hospital was a client of his. As a lawyer at Fisher Phillips, he had represented the hospital and had been there many times. He knew exactly where it was. And this makes sense to me, despite the fact that Grady was known to be the place for a gunshot wound. Tex went to the first hospital he knew how to get to. What Tex and Danny Joe didn't know was that there was a firehouse some 300 yards or so from where the SUV was sitting when Diane was shot. Though the exact distance is estimated because they were on a section of Piedmont where the traffic cameras were not working. Danny Joe also wasn't sure which stoplight she was at. So there were medics extremely close by. I think the decision to drive to a hospital, any hospital, was a mistake. They should have called 911. At the hospital, Tex is seen on security cameras, jumping out of the SUV and waving Danny Joe through to the emergency doors. He also helps get his wife into a wheelchair. Dr. Suzanne Hardy took Diane's case at the ER. Diane made a spontaneous comment in front of the doctor while she was examining her. She said, quote, It was an accident. At trial, the prosecution focused on her only other statement. She said, I'm dying. And then the doctor asked if she wanted to see her husband, and Diane said no. To this I say Diane was dying. Who knows if she even understood the doctor's question at that point. Her blood pressure was extremely low, and she was about to be taken in for emergency surgery. The other, spontaneous comment can be considered a dying declaration. It was not an answer to a question made under duress. Diane just said it. The bullet hit where Diane's 11th rib met her 11th vertebra, scattering pieces of bone. It then traveled through her left adrenal gland and left kidney and severed blood vessels going into her spleen, then through her pancreas and stomach. So blood quickly started filling her abdominal cavity. The bullet missed her heart by centimeters, but because it nicked those arteries, she bled out internally anyway. Dr. Hardy wanted to transfer her to Grady, but Diane was never stable enough for transfer. In the operating room, surgeons opened her abdomen, only to find several liters of blood, close to what would be the total blood volume in her body. For over an hour, surgeons fought to save Diane's life, tying off damaged blood vessels and removing pieces of damaged organs but her blood pressure kept dropping. The attending surgeon's report read, Her chance of survival was zero at this stage. There is no disagreement whatsoever among anyone involved, including all of the surgeons and the anesthesiologist, that we could have done anything differently and given her a chance to survive. At the hospital, Tex called an old friend of his. This would wind up being a very bad decision. His friend was also an attorney, an attorney who had represented him before. Stephen Maples is a Decatur attorney who defended Tex when he was charged in 1990 with three counts of aggravated assault for firing his pistol at a car with three young men inside. The teens had been hanging out in the cul-de-sac of Tex's neighborhood, playing their music loud and annoying him. He tried sicking his dogs on them before he got his gun out. But the charges were dropped when Tex agreed to pay for the damages to the teen's car. And this was the guy who sat on the American Bar Association Committee on Gun Violence. It's an example of what the prosecution would later seize upon. Tex was a politically connected white man. He got away with that incident 15 years earlier, 
and now he was involved in another gun incident. At the hospital, Tex and Stephen Maples were overheard conferring, and Tex was heard saying, What do I say? What do I do? Naturally, there was much made of this at trial. But honestly, if you had just shot your wife, even accidentally, wouldn't you be scared? But optics are everything, and his behavior, even while still at the hospital, put people off. And at this point, he had no idea that Diane had already told the doctor it was an accident. He went up to Danny Joe and said, why don't you just say you weren't there? Things like this can get so turned around. Just say you came here to be with us as a friend. And Danny Joe told him no, she couldn't do that. Quote, Tex, I just drove you to the R. I can't do that. Why would I be here at this time of night on a Sunday without my own car? Danny Joe talked to the Atlanta police right away and insisted it was a tragic accident. She said there was no doubt in her mind. And this was even after his strange request for her to lie at the hospital. She didn't tell police about Texas' request the first time they questioned her, but she did the second time. And a very different Danny Joe testified at trial. She did not change her story, but she was no longer on Texas' side. She now believed the shooting was intentional. I think, like everyone else, she was put off by Texas' behavior after Diane's death starting with him asking her to lie at the hospital. Afterwards, he went so far as to call Danny Joe's husband and tell him to get Danny Joe to retract what she told the police. Interestingly, Texas defense team found another reason for Danny Joe's flip. Diane had loaned her money also, as she did for many friends and associates, and Tex expected her to pay the loan. Now, this isn't as heartless as it sounds. Tex was executor of Diane's estate. Danny Joe wasn't the only friend expected to repay their loan. And about Tex's behavior? Well, first of all, Tex didn't go voluntarily talk to police for two days. That does look bad. Why wouldn't you just sit down with him right away if it was an accident? And why didn't the police insist on speaking with him right away? I'm pretty sure if I shot my husband, I would be questioned that same day, even with a witness saying it was an accident. It does show that Tex was getting preferential treatment. The police felt confident it was an accident after taking Danny Joe's statement. So maybe this isn't as bad as it looks. But again, optics are everything. And to the world, this looked like a rich, white lawyer with political connections wasn't being questioned by the police right away. And why would he choose to wait? Friends say Tex was beside himself. It wasn't to get his story straight. He was just in shock. When he did finally talk to the police, he said the gun was in his lap and it just went off. Tex told police, quote, I was handling the gun, I forgot it was in my lap, and it just went off. And I don't think he's lying. Tex was diagnosed with REM behavioral disorder, which means where most people don't act out their dreams, Tex often did thrash around. Bill Rankin with the AJC podcast Breakdown explained this diagnosis very well. He said normally, people have a wall between their dreams and actual bodily movements in reaction to the dream. People with REM behavioral disorder somehow, quote, breach that wall. Specifically, Tex would clench his fingers and thrash his arms. A masseuse named Annie Anderson testified at Tex's trial about his condition. He often fell asleep while getting a massage, and she had to be careful about where she was standing in relation to his body if he fell asleep or he might accidentally hit her. She also had to testify to deny allegations of a sexual relationship with Tex. I will come back to this in a moment. The next big mistake Tex made was hiring a PR consultant by the name of Bill Crane. He made an official statement to the press that Tex was alarmed about the recent unrest surrounding several Black Lives Matter protests in the area and feared that they would be carjacked. This is the mistake that took this case national. Black Lives Matter representatives across the country were outraged. In fact, there is no evidence that there were protesters in that area on the night of September 6th. As many people have said, Bill Crane injected race into a case where it did not belong. I agree to a certain extent. First of all, Tex McIver denies ever saying this. He said Crane made that statement. All he had said was that it was a bad area. Crane stands by his statement and testified that Tex tried to get him to retract the statement. 
This would lead to one of the three charges the prosecution indicted Tex for of trying to manipulate a witness. The other two counts for the same thing were for when he asked Annie Jo to lie and say she wasn't in the SUV that night, and also for the message he left on her husband's voicemail. Tex foolishly left the voicemail for Danny Joe's husband from jail. This was before he made bond. He found out that Danny Joe told the police what he had asked her to do, and he called her husband to ask him to get Danny Joe to stop talking to the police. Oh, and he also said, delete this message. Except all calls coming out of the Fulton County Jail are recorded. Foolish indeed. And that is what I think is Tex McIver's huge problem. He was arrogant and foolish. But before he had ever even been indicted, he made his next huge mistake. Within days of Diane's death, he was taking inventory of her extensive collection of couture clothing, furs, shoes, hats, and jewelry. And then he auctioned everything off. He held three auctions, actually. And this is really hard for people to swallow. It was tacky. It was unseemly. And it definitely looked callous. But Diane's estate lawyer actually advised Tex to do this until they could liquidate assets to cover not only her bequests, but other financial issues related to her estate and just the wrapping up of her life. But still, this looked awful. The estate lawyer spoke with the AJC and defended the advice he gave, saying those clothes would depreciate within a year when styles change. And also, you need to sell winter clothes at the start of winter. Diane had 137 fur coats. The auctions were held in early December. Okay, I get all of that. But it's hard to believe that this guy and Tex both thought that this was a good idea. But then, I think about it this way. Tex said it was an accident. I don't think he really believed that he would be prosecuted, so why not follow the lawyer's advice? He was not officially charged until December 21st, after the auctions and he was charged with involuntary manslaughter and reckless conduct. One big point of contention with this auction is not only how it looked. There were some ruby and diamond pieces that had been willed to a friend of Diane's with the same birthstone. If he was really auctioning to honor requests, why would he auction pieces for someone in the will? Pieces that she was supposed to get. Well, she wasn't supposed to get those pieces. According to the AJC, in total, there was a ruby ring, bracelet, and earrings that brought around $18,000 at auction. Now that's no small amount. But Diane had many other ruby and diamond pieces, and in fact, there was a ring, bracelet, and earrings valued at more than 100000 that he did not auction. He was saving those for her friend. Texas Bond was set at $75,000, which he quickly made and was out until trial. By April, prosecutors served multiple subpoenas for the McIver's financial records. Now it would seem that the DA's office did not agree with the Atlanta PD. They didn't believe this was an accident. During the search of Texas condo, a Glock pistol was found in his sock drawer. This was a violation of his bond. He had all other firearms removed from the condo and ranch except this one. The judge revoked Texas bond, and then a few days later, on April 27th, he was indicted on a charge of malice murder. Georgia's malice murder charge is what many states refer to as first-degree murder. The DA indicted Tex on seven additional counts. He was also charged with felony murder, which is what other states call second-degree murder, then aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, possession of a firearm, and commission of a felony, and those three charges of trying to influence witnesses that I told you about. And this trial would be dramatic in so many ways. For one, they had a judge who allowed jurors to ask questions throughout the trial, not just in deliberations. This is highly unusual, and something the defense attorneys didn't like. If the state wasn't making their case clear enough, that's on them. This judge allowing clarification questions clearly gives the prosecution a leg up. Prosecutor Clint Rucker is one of those preacher prosecutors, a natural-born theatrical speaker. He uses that thing where he says something and then repeats it for emphasis. He recites poetry or scripture. His booming voice and lyrical way of speaking is very effective in a courtroom. In late October of 2017, three days before the trial was to begin, the prosecution asked for a continuance, saying they felt the defense needed more time which was some hilarious legal wrangling, because the defense strongly disputed this. 
If they needed a continuance, they would have asked for it. Bill Rankin with AJC said that the prosecution was actually still looking for evidence to support their indictment of malice murder. So they put it on hold for four months and then came back. The AJC also pointed out that they had some 90,000 email to go through between Tex and Diane. The state's position is that Tex McIver needed, not just wanted, his wife's fortune. They also brought up the specter of supposed affairs he was having which was convenient as it was the reason his ex-wife divorced him. But they could never find any proof of an affair. Tex worshipped his wife. The state brought a woman named Annie Anderson to testify. She was the masseuse I mentioned earlier. She came over and gave massages to Diane and Tex regularly. Being wealthy people, they didn't make appointments at a salon. They had a personal masseuse who came to their house. And it's important to note that she treated both the McIvers and also considered them close friends, as did many of their employees. Annie Anderson and Rachel Stiles, Diane's other personal assistant, stayed with Tex the first couple of days after the shooting because they were afraid he would mix up his medication and hurt himself. Annie slept on the floor in Tex's room. The prosecution had a field day with this. But you know what is gross? Their godson, Austin, was sleeping in the bed with Tex. Were they insinuating that he had sex with Annie with his godson in the room? For her part, Annie Anderson was angry and humiliated that this was even insinuated. She was a professional, and this accusation was detrimental to her career. And what's more, she cared about the McIvers. That is really clear in her testimony. But aside from imaginary affairs, all the state really had was money. Tex wanted Diane's money. As I told you, his income had drastically decreased. At his age, he was no longer an equity partner but an income partner, and his expenses at the ranch were exorbitant. And it is something he and Diane were talking about. In an email the state found, he tells her he's trying to reduce his monthly expenses. She then playfully suggests that he take over the job of his ranch hand at the Putnam County Ranch. He says, well... Guess it's back to being a gigolo. And the state thought this was nefarious. The defense thought it was playful banter. Yes, there were money issues, but Tex still made money, and he and Diane were both millionaires. They would work it out. To me, this sounds very much like playful banter. I would hate for a prosecutor to see some of the texts I sent to my own husband when joking around. Danny Joe Carter was the state's star witness at trial. They later even called her the MVP. But the biggest problem with the state's case is all the promises they made in the opening statement. They continued to allude to a second will, a will they could never prove existed. It was never found. It's why they wanted to go through all those emails. And when they did find an email talking about wills, but nothing was formalized, the lawyer who was copied on this email told the AJC that drafting a will for people is kind of like selling life insurance. Folks keep putting this stuff off because they don't want to think about it. The lawyer didn't think it was fishy at all. And yes, the state proved that Tex was ever spending and his income had gone down. But in reality, Diane made more money than him. If he was really worried that much about money, it makes more sense for Diane to live. She was the breadwinner. And every friend agreed that they were in love, ridiculously in love, the kind of couple who, after five years of dating and ten years of marriage, still held hands all the time. Friends turned on Tex by the time of the trial because of his many bad, callous-looking choices. He did auction off her things. And he also asked a colleague of hers if he would be able to draw her Social Security benefits. This was only a few days after her death. And that's the problem with Tex. He not only takes bad advice, but he makes bad decisions but none of that makes him a murderer. I do think he was worried about how he would live out his days, how he would maintain this lifestyle. And he could also just be a greedy bastard. That's true. But I don't think he killed her over it. She was the one keeping him in such a lavish lifestyle to begin with. And he adored her. Even friends who turned against him couldn't argue with that. It's why they found it so shocking. At trial... Tex did not take the stand in his own defense. I am not going to take you gavel to gavel through the trial of Tex McIver. 
I would rather point you to the excellent podcast breakdown by the AJC that I've already mentioned. Their long-form podcast on this case covers Texas trial extensively, so I will just give you some highlights. There were competing firearms experts. One sticking point is that no one knows if the gun was actually cocked. The police didn't ask that question right away, and Tex later said he couldn't remember. The difference is, if it wasn't cocked, it takes 12 pounds of pressure to pull that trigger. If it was cocked, it takes less than 2 pounds. That makes a lot more sense for an accidental shooting. There was no way to know for sure, but I am willing to bet that after Diane handed Tex the gun, he cocked it to be ready and had it sitting in his lap, and then he did nod off back to sleep. And many people have difficulty with this. If he was afraid enough to ask for his gun, how could he just nod off? To this I say, he was 73 years old. He had played golf in the hot Georgia sun for four hours and then had been drinking wine. The defense also made some really good points about why, if he wanted to kill his wife, would he do it this way? Why try and shoot her in the car, through the seat? There was a great chance that the bullet could have ricocheted back at him, or get lodged in Diane's seat. There's any possible scenario that would have made this a strange way to kill his wife, the first problem being that he did it in front of her best friend. But the prosecution did do a good job of making Tex out to be the entitled, white, rich, politically connected man he was. None of that is false. It just makes the police look bad for not going after him harder in the first place. However, I don't think the police were going that easy on him. The detective on his case had worked over 40 malice murder cases before. He had an excellent record. He had an eyewitness that said it was an accident. He had a dying declaration from the victim saying it was an accident. I will say that they definitely should have brought him in for formal questioning that night, if for no other reason than protocol. If his connections helped at all, it was that they gave him those couple of days before their formal interview. The problem was, both the prosecution and defense went all or nothing in closing arguments. Both asked the jury not to find him guilty of involuntary manslaughter. The defense wanted a straight not guilty. This was an accident. The state wanted premeditated malice murder. So the original involuntary manslaughter charge was taken off the table. The jury could choose malice or felony, or they could find him not guilty. But that was it. During deliberations, the jury kept sending out questions that made the defense feel pretty good. They didn't seem to grasp the legal definition of intent. Things were looking pretty good for Tex, especially once the jury sent word that they were deadlocked. But the judge gave them instructions to keep deliberating. And then they came back with a confusing verdict. They found Tex guilty of felony murder, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, possession of a firearm and commission of a felony, and witness influencing. The reason it's confusing is felony murder is like second-degree murder. It means a person was killed in the commission of another felony. In this case, that would be the aggravated assault charge. Meaning, there was no actual intent to kill Diane, but just to harm her. See what I mean by the jury not understanding intent. So why did they decide this way, with the conflicting verdicts? Why would Tex shoot Diane unless he meant to kill her? The problem here lies in what the jury was not allowed to ask. Malice murder and felony murder have the same punishments, but they were not allowed to ask how long Tex would go to prison for these offenses. They did ask, but of all the questions that this judge allowed, he refused this one. And it is a matter of law, except in capital cases, juries are not to consider punishment during their deliberations. Maybe they thought that felony murder was a lesser charge when in reality, it's basically the same in terms of punishment. Tex McIver will spend the rest of his natural life in prison. He would have if he had been convicted of malice murder also. I think the defense made a crucial mistake with the all-or-nothing charge to the jury. Typically, all types of murder charges are on an indictment to give the jury an out if they don't believe it was premeditated. It's not surprising the prosecution wanted this charge removed, but it was the defense who really rolled the dice here. Tex is now embroiled in a wrongful death suit with Diane's estate, but here's the thing. So is Danny Joe Carter. She is named in the same suit. The suit says that she breached the duty of driving in a safe manner at all times. 
but specifically cites her decision not to call 911 and to drive to an ER instead. As of May of 2019, the lawsuit hasn't been settled. So I'm sure by now you guys know what I think. I think Tex McIver was guilty of involuntary manslaughter due to reckless conduct. I do not believe he intended to murder his wife. I think he is an old man who had handled guns his whole life and never thought something like this could happen to him. I think it was a horrible tragedy. And his behavior after the fact was shitty. He took bad advice and also made several bad choices on his own. He really was his own worst enemy. But being a dumbass does not make you a murderer. And you know what? Maybe race did belong in this trial. Regardless of whether Tex made the Black Lives Matter comment or if it was really his PR guy, the specter of race is there. This bad spot of town they were stopped at wasn't just about homeless people, it was about black people. Tex was an old white guy. His automatic response to this kind of neighborhood is indicative of his own racial bias, whether he was conscious of it or not. And ironically, Diane McIver had donated money to the Blue Lives Matter campaign in Atlanta. Tex may or may not have understood the Black Lives Matter movement, but it would seem that his wife did. Either way, when he awoke on this dark street, he didn't feel safe, so he said, Darling, hand me my gun. And Diane McIver handed her husband the gun that killed her. Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic artist by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. I want to give a special shout out to listeners who came to my first live show in Atlanta. I know you had a preview of this case, but I really hope you enjoyed the full Monty. Thank you so much for your support and coming to the show. If you're a patron of Southern Fried, I posted the live show as well, and there, you get to hear me say all the cuss words. The live show was an incredible experience, and I can't thank you enough. Also, Carmen, if you're listening, thank you so much for your thoughtful card. You can't imagine how much it means to me. The sources for today's episode were mainly local to Atlanta, though this case definitely went national and you can watch the trial in its entirety on YouTube. However, my main resource was the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and their amazing podcast breakdown, which covered the trial in full. I have a link to their website and my show notes. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on most large platforms like Stitcher and Spotify and other podcatchers. If you're interested in supporting the show, please visit my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com. There you can sign up to be a patron of the show, make a one-time donation, or purchase show merchandise. That's southernfriedtruecrime.com. If you have any case suggestions, please email southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. Sometimes private messages on social media get lost, so email is best, and please feel free to reach out. I love hearing from you guys. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.